that. Um, but for now, I will leave you with Tim, who is going to talk to you about the uh, upcoming ap apocalypse. So, thanks for coming to the sauna. Let's get started. Um, so, imagine. Imagine this scene. It's the year 2025. You open the wooden box and take the relic out carefully, hold it in your hands, and then you try to press the button, and it flickers briefly, but then it goes dark again. And the last iPhone on Earth has died forever. So that's sort of like the mood like I want to set for this talk. And there's three main points I want to make if I yeah okay let's just do it like this there's uh, three main points I want to make so a our current civilization though we take it for granted is much much more fragile than it seems the second point is if we think about survival, we have, have to think about long-term survival, not immediate survival. And the third point I want to make is, um, well, the best time to start preparing and to start experimenting is, of course, right now. Okay, so first, um, let's look at fragility. So there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right? Maybe you say, yeah, but will it really have uh, that big of an impact? Well, I, I can give you a few examples what could potentially happen. Um, it could be something external. It could, for example, be something like um, a large asteroid strike or a large meteorite strike, right? We have craters, we have found craters um, in the Earth, uh, in the crust of the Earth, and if something on this scale would happen again, then well, okay, it's obvious that nothing can survive in the immediate impact zone, right? Uh, so you're saying, yeah, okay, maybe if it happens on, in Australia, it's not so bad over here. Well, it will be, because basically, basically what happens is a lot of, um, when the impact happens, a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff is swept up into the atmosphere, and the whole Earth will go dark in, in a very short time. And when the Earth goes dark, when the sunlight is blocked, all the plants will die, all the animals will die, and we will also die. So that's one possible scenario. It could also be something that is not external, but it could be something that we cause ourselves, right? It, like nuclear war is always an option. Um, maybe <laughs> even becoming more of an option at, at the end of this year. We don't know, right? But it's really, there's like 3,000 nukes on the Earth right now, I think. Um, and just... Not even, we don't even need 3,000, right? Just a couple of them, let's say like 10, 20, would have the same effect. There's total annihilation where they strike, but then in the aftermath, there is darkness and widespread uh, chaos. Well, then there's other options. If you're still not convinced, right? I have other options for you. I could offer uh, a deadly virus that breaks out. This is also something that could actually, that could just be happening right now. We don't know, right? Just a virus that mutates in a way that it has a long um, incubation period, but it's at the same time quite deadly or quite dangerous. Then it would immediately spread. I mean, we have. This is the nice thing, like we have everything is connected. Normally it's a good thing, but in this case it's a very bad thing because it would mean the virus would basically reach everybody on the whole earth, except maybe some disconnected tribes in the Amazon or something, right? So, um, why does this, why, why, why do I say that civilization is more fragile than it seems? Well, okay, so there are these things that could potentially happen. But then the other thing we have to take into account is that we are very much, um, as I said, everything is interconnected right now, right? If you look at a, a, medi medieval, um, a medieval town or medieval village, it is maybe not 100% self-sufficient, but it's pretty self-sufficient. Whereas on the other hand, we are anything but, right? We need, for example, to make the iPhone, right? It, this is like, it's 
if you really look at all the thing that goes into an iPhone, where the, all the raw materials they have to be fetched from Africa, um, smelted somewhere, transported again, turned into parts, turned into sub-assemblies, turned into the final assembly, and it's 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 mind-boggling, right? This is the whole Earth is collaborating to make just this one, this one, this one magical object, and I can hold it in my hand finally. But this is not just for the iPhone, right? The same is also true for uh, most kinds of foods, most kinds of machines that we use. And so the problem in that is if, let's say, I'm from Germany, right? I, I, would, I would say in the whole of Germany, 80 million people, there is there's not 100 people that could make an axe from scratch, probably. Maybe there's more, but I don't know, right? But we can make what what we can make is like specialized motors for cars, specialized parts for uh, rockets, everything, right? But we can't do that. Well, we, a we won't have to do that. But b this is not like this is this is, we can only do because the parts are coming from China, the parts are coming are being assembled in Vietnam, everything, right? So everything is connected. So even even if it's not the total global catastrophe, even if it's just, just say a local catastrophe, local that takes out um, most of Asia, we are still we still have a problem, <laughs> a severe problem. Okay, so this is um, this is uh, part number one. Why I think the civilization is quite quite more fragile than it seems. Second part. If we are, if we were serious about survival, in such a case, what would we have to to do? What would we have to look at? And then there is like there are these people called preppers. They um, they uh, always get very excited when the world is about to end, like uh, in the year 2000, right? And then they come out and make preparations. They they go to Walmart and buy um, I don't know, 1,000 um, cans of of beans, right? And uh, two tons of flour, right? And this is all nice and good, and it would actually probably help in the first year. But after that, when all the beans are eaten, right, what do you do then, right? So this is short-term survival. This is, um, this is not so interesting to me. This is also very, it's more like you're concerned with yourself, right? I want to survive. Whereas I think, um, well, uh, Igor, in another talk, he put it like this, the humanity currently, it's like the nervous system of the planet. And so we should not think about how can I survive, but how can we, how can we make sure that this nervous system in, in, some, in some form or other can survive, right? So that's, that's what I mean with long-term thinking in survival. The short term, of course, <laughs> first, some, some people have to survive short term, of course, otherwise we can't do it. But I'm more interested in what would we have to do if we expect to do this long term. And I think we need uh, three kinds of things to make this work long term. And the first one is seeds, the second one is tools, and the third one is knowledge. So seeds is pretty obvious because this is something we cannot manufacture, right? Seeds, either we have them, and if we don't have any, then, then we're fucked. But I hear you saying, okay, so I will just go to the next field and take some wheat and there are my seeds, right? Uh, I'm done. Why do I have to prepare for that? Well, the problem is the kind of wheat that's growing in the fields, this is not the kinds of seeds you want. This is hybrid seed. This will, if you seed it and grow it the next year, it will produce very different plants from what you're seeing right now in the field. And it would take uh, several, like it would take like ten years to grow this into. Even if you know how to do it, it would take a, a longer time to grow this into a viable seed uh, again. So what we actually want is um, the the kinds of like what's called heirloom seeds, seeds that are still in the original form, uh, not bred um, into a hybrid form, and well. There is happily there is a large store of these seeds. It's the Svalbard seed seed Svalbard seed vault. If you have heard about it, um, it is in Svalbard. That is um, an island, and in, in it's basically in the middle between Iceland and and the North Pole. So the seeds are very well protected there. That's the good the good thing. The bad thing is we would have to go there and fetch them if you want to use them, right? So it is not really, I mean, this is, of course, it is also 
meant as a backup, as a plan B. But it, right now it is mainly a backup for seed banks that put their stuff there, basically put a backup copy there to fetch it again if their local, like the, the working copy is destroyed. But we could use it. But even better, we should have um, distributed seeds, seed banks basically everywhere to maximize the chance that wherever, like, who, wherever people are able to survive, then they have seeds readily available. Um, and that, yeah, that is that is the first thing, seeds. Um, tools. Tools are, in a way, also something like seeds, right? Because tools are what allow us to make new things. So uh, uh, an anvil and a hammer, this is quite a small thing still, allows me potentially to make uh, hundreds and thousands of other tools that I can use then to bootstrap um, other parts of society that are still needing tools, right? So I think it's it's more viable to concentrate on the tools that are, yeah, that are compact tools, that tools for making other tools. And then let's say we have seeds, we have tools. Now the most important part still missing is, is know-how, is knowledge. Is, I mean, me, with a hammer and an anvil, I could start poking around and trying to figure it out, but it would be much better uh, if I had already done the workshop that's happening this evening, for example, right? And then I had a, sort of like a head start uh, on, on doing something useful. Um, and the same is true for everything else. There's like, the same is true for um, agriculture. Like if you have never had a garden and you just read about it, it sounds, oh, everything sounds very nice and easy. But <laughs> when you try it, it's not that easy. There's uh, unforeseen complications. And so my feeling is it's better to work out all the kinks like right now than later when we don't have the time, right? Maybe you just have this one harvest and it has to work. Either it works or you're dead. <laughs> So I, in this case, I would rather prefer to have it done already a few times beforehand, right? So in the third part, I was going. I wanted to show a few examples of um, of things that me and others have been trying, experimenting with, and I call this approach um, seed banking. So, like I said, we need seeds. Tools are also seeds in a way. Knowledge is also a seed, it's not a, doesn't have to be complete. We can generate new knowledge, but we need the starting point. So together, um, we need these seeds and we have to store them in a way that they are readily available in a distributed fashion. So what I've been doing personally, um, I've been working on, on, I haven't actually built it, but I have constructed a seed bank, which is just like a, basically a, just a sandbox literally just a sandbox, because it doesn't have to, has to be refrigerated, right? If you make it deep enough, let's say half a meter, and put the, um, the glasses, the jars with seeds um, on the bottom, then I think, and maybe even cover the whole thing with boards or something, I will think this will, hopefully, this will stay like at quite a uniform temperature all over the year. It would be best if it was refrigerated. Like, if, like it's, it would be best if Germany had permafrost soil, but <laughs> it doesn't yet. Um, so that's that's one thing I'm working on. Then I'm working on growing potatoes. Very, I mean, it sounds banal, but um, it is actually like I said. You read about it. It sounds simple. You do it. And then oh, uh, mm, <laughs> okay. I didn't foresee that. <laughs> so I'm I will I'm looking forward to harvest my first crop this this fall. And let's see. The only potato I've taken out of the ground so far is like this. Yeah, but the growing season isn't isn't over yet, right? Um, what else? Oh yeah, there's this, I was going to show you a few screenshots. There's this, um, there's a guy in Australia and he has a, um, a YouTube channel and it's called Primitive Technology. Google it and then watch it <laughs> because it's awesome and so he's like he has this hobby there's less of a he's just like he thinks it's fun it's fun to go into the woods with empty hands and start making things so there's one video where he's um, basically he's literally starting with empty hands and he's making a house with a tiled roof okay so what does he do right he goes and and, and 
grabs a stick and uh, a suitable stone and makes a stone axe. Then he starts felling trees with a stone axe. Then he's erecting the, the, the beams for the house. And I don't know, what, he's just choosing stuff, right, that he finds there. And then he's making the tiles from clay. He builds a little oven to fire the tiles, puts the tiles on the roof. And that's, in this video, basically, it's like, it's like a, he shows everything. But of course, like the video is 15 minutes. It's, it probably took him like, I would say, a month or so to do the whole thing, right? It's just a hobby. He has a full-time job. He lives in a normal house. He just does this for fun. And he has like tons of other stuff. And I truly really encourage you to, to check that out. Mm. I can't remember. There were two other examples I was going to to bring up. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, in Germany, we have uh, children's... Like, now, once you have this mindset, right? Once you have this mindset and, 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 and watching out for stuff that could be useful, you see it everywhere. Like this, on German children's television, there is a very famous um, program called Sendung mit der Maus. Um, and they have like comic stuff and then they always, they have one topic each, um, each week where they show how something is made. So they go to factories, they show how the biscuit is made or whatever. And then they had this like a few weeks, a few weeks back, they had um, how our ancestors made iron and this totally blew my mind this was so awesome like i learned that there is a form of iron ore that just be, that you can just pick up from a field it's called bock iron ore and it's created by bacteria that uh, my mind was already blown at this point right i was like okay iron ore is something you find in the in a deep in a mountain no they just like they show actually there's like a plow going over the field and then you can pick up some of like oh stones yeah this is the iron ore okay and then they go um, and just on the lawn, they make a very primitive oven to, to smelt uh, the iron ore. They put in the ore, they put in charcoal, they put in... And this is so simple, right? But it, is, like, it looks very simple in the video. Maybe they practiced a few times, I don't know. Um, and it's, but it's also a lot of work. Like this, the, the, the oven, the kiln that they built was like... I think it was like two meters high or two and a half meters from clay, this took several days, and they had to fire it for, I don't know, a day or two. In the end, they, they push it, actually they push it over to get at the iron that is on, on the bottom. And then they have to still have to work out um, all the, like as many of the impurities um, that they can. And in the end they have like, I don't know, like maybe the size of an iPhone, right? That is, that is the amount of iron they produced in a week. So, but still, right? Still, it's kind of useful to know how to do it, and I would, uh, I would really would have. I was so envious that I was not there when they did it. Right, I would have loved to just be there and and watch instead of having this video. But the video is so cool. So, to sum it up, um, I think civilization is more fragile than we um, normally think, and so if we if we reflect on this fact and, and think about it, then it, it's, 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 even if, I'm not saying that something bad is happening next year or in the next 10 years. I don't, I'm not going to predict the future, right? But just because there is, I think, a non-zero possibility of something like this happening, it's quite rational to do, to do some kind of preparation for this case. And if we think about it, then the only, th like, I'm arguing the best thing we can do is um, long-term preparation. We can we can try to make sure that seeds seeds are all seeds are basically distributed all over the earth. Um, and in the uh, let's say there's just like maybe just Nicaragua so Nicaragua survives. Nothing else survives, right? But even then, they should have seeds they they can use, right? Maybe uh, they would have something anyway. They would have something like random stuff, but I want it to be a little bit more focused. Um, yeah, and well, the final, my final thought is, um, if you think, yeah, this is, um, I, I don't buy it, right? I don't buy the whole story. Then still, it's a nice framework. It's a nice, it, it's, it's, it's just a lot of fun playing around with stuff, right? And this is what I see 
I mean, people are doing this all over the place without this framework. So why not, why not just have this in the back of your mind while you tinker with stuff? And I set up a Google group if anybody's interested. It's empty, but it has the slides. So there's an incentive. <laughs> you, can, you can go there uh, and then you can check out the slides and see what I forgot to, to tell. Um, and it's um, tinyurl.com slash seed banking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very impressive to do that without slides or anything. Um, you, we still have four minutes for questions, if you want to take questions. Sure. Sure. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Hi. You were saying um, that there were three stages that you had to plan, the seeding, the tools and the knowledge. But um, what about material? Would that come under the knowledge of, say you were saying blacksmithing, would you say the knowledge of learning what steels you could use in a apocalypse situation, would that be classed as knowledge or would you put that in sort of like the seed banking, you stockpile a small amount of tool steel for tools in a future date? Yeah, so for the knowledge, I think it I, ideally I envision something like recipes, a collection of recipes. And I mean, we, we should not assume that the Earth is in the state of 2000 years ago. We should assume the Earth is in the current state. So if I maybe I would not start with bog iron ore, right? Maybe I would start with uh, how do I melt a lamppost? What's the best way to, to melt down a lamppost? Because it will be, give me a lot of iron quickly versus much more slowly, right? So, stuff like that. Practical stuff. Okay. Hi, uh, I have a question. I'm interested in what do you think are the pros and cons of decentralized and centralized prepping strategies? Well, as there's so much uncertainty what can happen, I would argue it's pretty clear that decentralized is, is much superior. Right, because let's like, say the Svalbard seed, seed vault, it's 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 awesome. It has 1.2 million different kinds of seeds, but if it's taken out, then it's gone. Right, so <laughs> this is sort of like the that is always the, the point against a centralized approach. Hi there, hi there. Um, it was quite a, quite an optimistic talk. Uh, I think Vinay Gupta has talked about buying a whole load of food and a crossbow with which to protect it. And you look at a lot of the Apocalypse TV programs like Walking Dead, the threat often comes from other people. Do you think there is uh, any kind of value in preparing sort of to defend yourself against other people who are coming for your seeds and blacksmithing equipment and so on? Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, I think there's more, more missing, right? This is more like the technology side than the whole part, like the whole organizational side. This is also something I was thinking about if just, like what's even needed to make a camp like this work, right? You need, yeah, you, it just, it, this is not, this is, there's order and it's not spontaneous, right? There's this um, planned order in the camp. And we would even, we need something like that in, on an even bigger scale, of course, to organize the survivors and deal with, yeah, also deal with people who are playing to other rules, right? Yes. One last question. No. Hi, uh, have you thought about like keep uh, storing bacterial colonies for making medicines or anything like that? Like, uh, sorry? Oh, well, yeah, yes, but yeah, that, that <laughs> kind of seeding. No, that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, no, I haven't, that's a little bit more tricky. Everything that's living is more tricky. Like I would also like to, to, to ensure that we have goats all right, and cows, but how do we do that? Right, we can't freeze dry a cow. <laughs> We could, we could do it. <laughs> yeah, no, um, if you have good ideas, then yeah, let's talk. <laughs> so we are out of time. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have more questions, I suppose you might be available. Out yeah, of the uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks.